So we have someone here who is ontologically different than the last time he was here. Well, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. Molto bene. Grazie. Um, uh, I give you a benediction. The name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A very great Congratulations. Very great day for us, and we are very happy to have been ordinary, ordained. And was that was that on the eighth? Yeah. The Immaculate Conception. Oh wow! Yeah, what a day. Tradition for us. Well, the deacon on the eighth of December, and then after six months in July or June, maybe we can go for being priest. Christian. Amen. Amen. How is your and then when will you be done with your uh, studies? About the same time? Uh, yes, but it's only a pastoral year. So it means only one year, and then we finish, even without a diploma, it's not necess necessary. Right. I I'm doing dogmatic, but I'm not sure to finish, because we need, if it's licensed, we need a thesis which could be more, it, it needs one more year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, very Please. good. Very good, well, congratulations. Thank you, thank you very much. So it seems like we're getting into that time of the year where as it's getting dark here, the sun is coming up there. That's right, that's right. It is coming up, it's still pretty dark out, but. And it's getting dark now here. Yeah. I wonder when it was, I don't know if you've ever, I mean, when it was that they realized there was time differences, because I would think that you'd have to be able to travel fast enough to be able to notice, or maybe they make the inference um, from, you know, from just thinking about it. I don't know. I've never thought about the question in that particular respect. Let's see what. Uh... Hmm. Uh, Have you heard of this book? Let me see here. here. I'm not looking at the screen. Uh, I can't see it. It's dark. That is true. Uh, yeah, I actually, I have seen, I have seen it. I've not read it. Okay. It's helpful, especially when you're working as a seminarian and you're trying to make sense of different positions and he brings, like I was just talking with Frashar Bell where his anthropology professor is talking about how, um, like the resurrection happens right after death and it's not like you're getting the body back that you had in this life, but that there's a whole, it, that whole sort of phenomenological turn. And he was just like, I don't even understand what he's, like, is he saying that you don't get you, like, it's not getting, you don't go into the separated state and then at the resurrection, you receive the same body that you had, uh, but that there's this something completely else. He's like, yeah, I, I think that's what he means from what I've heard. Yeah, that's the, yeah, that, I think that was kind of uh, in the generation of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, that was really pressed by uh, people who followed Karl Rahner. Yeah, so that, I mean, um, that's what I saw. I sent him something from like this new, the new dictionary of spirituality where it talked a bit like that. And so I sent him that. Um, but yes, I, I actually asked Father Thomas White, I sent him an email, one of the questions I had is, what is actual theology returned to? Like the Theologia Attuale? And he said, generally, it means the theology of the 70s. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what a, <laughs> if the theology of the 70s, anything like the architecture and music of the 70s, <laughs> I'd say that's not a, that's a, that's a bad turn. Yeah. That's a, not a Bonaventura, it's a Malaventura. <laughs> So yeah, so he, he he was not, you know, it's a term you hear from time to time. He also said, I don't know, maybe Fra Joseph has heard this more, the other term of contextualized theology, which he said is basically just sort of a uh, 
the European way of talking about a theology based in a secular paradigm. And he said, and it, sociologically, it's probably the same thing as liberal Protestantism and how it's going to end. We just end up evacuating, um, evacuating, you could say, the Christian message and the Christian churches. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. We're all anonymous Christians now. So anyways. Yeah, I'm sure it has to do with uh, the topics of inculturation and, and acculturation too. You know, you, you might you might call it the uh, you might call it the uh, apocalypse seventeen five through nine project. Apocalypse five. Seventeen five through nine project. <laughs> I have to look at. I'd have to look the verse up. Um, but I know what you're referring to when it comes. Yeah. To, uh, which yeah, it's. I was thinking they maybe some sociologists could do a response based on the 1973 project with Roe versus Wade and how that's basically dominated everything when it comes to American politics and life since then. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, going back to uh, that teaching on the resurrection, it's quite interesting, the implication and it, of course it's it's based upon a certain reading of uh first corinthians 15 and a, a kind of uh lack of nerve with respect to how in the world god's omnipotent power is going to uh bring this about because clearly this is something that is it's something that is beyond imagination how this could happen given what we understand of the uh physical processes and the interrelation through the degradation breakdown and reincorporation of our, you know, physical component parts throughout our lives, but also in death and, and decay. I think clearly it's a lack of nerve, but, you know, if you're going to take that lack of nerve with the resurrection, probably the uh, culminating claim of Christianity, then clearly you'll have to, uh, you'll have to uh, apply that same logic to every other mystery of the faith. Um, and, you know, the, the implications are, are quite enormous, with respect to the resurrection of Christ, of clearly the uh, messianic prophecies, especially the Psalms, you know, about not suffering his holy one to see corruption, uh, the non-corruption of our Lord's body um, and the resurrection in one and the same numerical, numerically identical body, but also the assumption. Um, our resurrections are going to be essentially different um, on that kind of reckoning, but then also it brings into uh, it brings into doubt the whole issue of the um, final judgment and the the ultimate restoration of all things, and it opens up a path for just you know this continuous process of history without without any culminating point, without any final transition, which you know goes against the whole uh, typological pattern of uh, the Old Testament within itself. You know, different junctions, different uh, moments of transition and recapitulation into new phases of life, uh, that kind of uh, discontinuity and uh, continuity in development. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really troubling theology and it goes hand in hand in glove with, you know, this, this contextualized notion of theology where you're evacuating the Christian faith of all of its dogmatic and metaphysical import and content while you're also evacuating the churches yeah um you know there there seems to be no purpose i mean christ i mean paul said you know if the resurrection isn't true we're of we're of all men most to be pitied i don't i don't remember exactly where that passage is um off the top of my head second thessalonians second thessalonians okay first thessalonians so that's I'm just thinking because that's where he also talks about the rapture, and so I, or <laughs> yeah, that's in that's in that's in one of the Thessalonians, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, I don't know. Maybe we should get started. I don't anticipate this lecture, this lesson taking as long because this first chapter is pretty short. Um, I just hit the high points, and then you know, given Father Peter's method, which is very in this sense Bonaventurian to. Uh, kind of lay out his overall 
plan of action and then to basically cycle through ba the, the, the same outline um, emphasizing different points and aspects throughout the progression of the book. Uh, we will we will revisit many of these themes. The point of this chapter is again to kind of lay the groundwork and to establish in good uh, scotistic fashion the priority of intention because remember uh, you know our theology is practical it's based upon what is what God has concretely uh, revealed and um, the uh, that which is first an intention is the purpose or cause for which an action is undertaken and it's also the you know last in execution so in this respect we have to understand especially with saint maximilian uh the order of intention is is primary because he was never able to in a sense the book he was going to write uh on the immaculate conception uh, was actually written in his flesh through his martyrdom of charity. Uh, so he took on a different, the stigmata in uh, a more mundane, uh, but also more horrific uh, sense and context. So the the book that uh, he was going to write on the Immaculate and the, the Holy Spirit uh, was written in his martyrdom of charity. So the uh, order of intention is key. So let me just um, share the screen here and we can get started and you know if we get through this lesson quickly uh, there may be uh, a, a few minutes for give and take uh, and uh, questions and responses but again i think you know in, in certain points uh, particular terms that that show up i think uh you know it's just a it's just a, an occupational hazard with reading um father peter that uh, he will throw terms out there, and if you give him time, he will define his terms, but he doesn't always um, define them at the outset. So again, you know, just a, uh, a note to the uh, careful reader, pay close attention to the glossary as well as uh, the index. If you come, ag come across the term, uh, look at the different places the term comes up if it's not adequately defined when uh, Father Peter first uses it. It's just his way. And I think it has a kind of uh, mnemonic uh, force uh, because you're, you have repeated exposures to a given term and the meaning of the term is unfolded in a good Wittgensteinian uh, methodology through its usage. And you see uh, this, this, this uh, network of family resemblances <clears throat> and a definition being worked out uh, in real time in real application. So it's a very practical way of doing it, even if it isn't uh, always uh, most easily entered into in the first read. So let me share the screen and we will get started after a word of prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit <clears throat> through the intercession of the glorious, immaculate, and ever Virgin Mary, fill our hearts and minds, give us clarity of understanding, guide my words and guide the thoughts and questions of those who listen to this lecture. Let them be uh, illumined in their minds and hearts and let their love for you and what you've done, Heavenly Father, through your Son and through your Holy Spirit, in your Holy Spirit, in your church, uh, continue to increase to the maximum of the glory of your Son and yourself in the Holy Spirit and the perfect sanctification and divinization of our, each of us and the church as a whole. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's see here. That's not showing up, is it? I am I do you see what I'm sharing now? Um, yes, we see your screen. Okay. All right. Um, yes. Good. Welcome. I didn't realize we had others here. Um, slideshow. Okay, from the beginning. All right. I think we can begin. So this lesson looks at the first chapter of Father Peter's Theologian of Auschwitz. And the first chapter deals with 
uh, St. Maximilian's order of intention, what he was trying to accomplish. And this order of intention um, is referring to not just the book, but how the book was to, in a sense, take flesh in the cities of the Immaculate and in the um, uh, Militia Immaculate as a kind of leading edge, as a unifying cause, as a unifying vision or structure to operate from within the Franciscan order in terms of what St. Maximilian understood to be the purpose of the Franciscan order, but precisely with um, both an inward uh, contemplative aspect, but a contemplative aspect that was ultimately that we may become good in the words of St. Bonaventure, or ultimately that we may love God and neighbor our theology as practical in the uh, expression of a blessed John Duns Scotus. And so this book was to serve the, the Franciscans within the context of the city of the Immaculate or cities of the Immaculate in the mission or operation of the, the MI in order to renew and fulfill the purpose of the Franciscan family but also for the Franciscan family to carry out mission within the broader church in terms of the incorporation of the Immaculate Conception in the life of the church so that the church fully takes on in its members and in its head and in its total reality that um, Marian profile, that perfect profile of the perfect bride of Christ as the primary member of the church, but also through becoming little Marys ourselves, we take on then and we give birth in our souls and in society, the Christic profile, that perfect man. And so there's a very, uh, there's kind of a twofold aspect or purpose in terms of uh, what St. Maximilian was trying to intend. So Father Peter's uh, fundamental thesis is in, in order to understand St. Maximilian's proposal for a book and thus his overall vision for the church in, the, in, in its presence, present existence, and Father Peter will extend this in terms of the reception of the Second Vatican Council and its teaching on the nature of the church, which of course uh, came after St. Maximilian himself, um, but also then the subsequent magisterium of the church, especially those uh, key encyclicals of uh, John Paul II, uh, Redemptoris Mater, uh, Missio Redem Redemptoris, uh, Fides et Ratio, and uh, Veritatis Splendor, uh, Ut Unum Sint, the great encyclicals of uh, John Paul II. Um, Father Peter asserts that we must understand the project of St. Maximilian books in terms of St. Maximilian's overall vision. And this is what he tries to lay out in um, sketch form in this first chapter, where he lays his cards on the table. Father Peter lays his cards on the table in terms of how he's approaching St. Maximilian, and he also tries to frame St. Maximilian's overall approach in, in this first chapter in terms of the key themes that he sees um, influencing and informing the, the proposed book of St. Maximilian's, but also how this influence and intention of St. Maximilian on this book through his life uh, could be interpreted and received in terms of the, 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 the most solid theological and historical basis of St. Maximilian, that is as a, a Franciscan theologian, uh, highly influenced by his, his devotion to Our Lady, his devotion to St. Francis and his <clears throat> theological predilections on uh, key points of theological methodology and also key doctrinal um, axiomatic positions of St. Bonaventure and Scotus. Bonaventure especially for theological methodology, Scotus especially for um, theological finality in terms of theology as practical, but also in terms of the key, the two key pillars of Franciscan theology that makes it uh, distinct and which is in itself rooted in a fundamental conviction. The two key pillars being the absolute primacy of Christ, the, the unconditioned predestination of Christ through a Marian mode and its twin 
um, dogma, the Immaculate Conception. And both of these two uh, doctrines represent in the economy the Trinitarian life of God flowing out of the Father eternally into the Son and in and through the Son and with the Son uh, into the Holy Spirit, creating that nexus of or bond of love or charity, thus indicating that charity has a certain prim priority. First uh, John um, gives witness to this, God is love. And so the, the two fundamental pillars of Franciscan theology, the, the absolute primacy of Christ and the Immaculate Conception are rooted in a prior understanding nevertheless revealed in the incarnation and the immaculate conception and divine maternity. Nevertheless, through this revelation in the economy, we understand that the first reality that we, we can speak of about God is his love. God is love. And so this primacy of charity is uh, undergirding and informing all of St. Maximilian's project. And this will give a certain coloration and priority to his theology as practical and as charity having a certain pride of, of place. So um, Father Peter in this first chapter is laying out then that our primary concern in order to begin to understand St. Maximilian is to understand his intention, clearly his intention and not the outcome because St. Maximilian was never able to finish his book. And this had three basic elements, um, theology, Mariology, and then mission as a Franciscan in the church. And I've kind of already touched upon those, but the importance is here to understand the re, the re uh, framing or understanding of Franciscan in an integral of theology, excuse me, in an integral manner, which prioritizes charity, the um, primacy of Christ in the Immaculate Conception. And our reflection uh, on all theology, all its parts uh, has to take on this Trinitarian and uh, Christocentric or Christomarianocentric uh, coloration to then understand how we fit into the plans of the father in relation to Christ and his mother in the context of the church, both in the church and with the church <clears throat> looking towards the nation, ad gentes, uh, in terms of its mission. And this will then have implications uh, with this kind of radicalizing and integrating of all of our theology in terms of the, the full appreciation both intellectually, speculatively, but also uh, contemplatively and uh, practically of the reality of the Immaculate Conception, the, the Immaculate Conception as that first created response, that first response of the good creation in harmony and cooperation with the creator spirit to bring about the incarnation of God himself, the second person of the Trinity, in order to return us, to re-situate us, to re-head us, to recapitulate us um, into a higher divinizing and redemptive economy. Uh, we have to understand the pivotal role that Mary plays, the central role. And St. Maximilian uh, says that this has actually radical implications and we'll, we'll touch upon this later, but he believes that when the cause of the Immaculate Conception was in a sense uh, culminated uh, in the 1854 definition. This was only the beginning uh, in, a, in conversations recorded by uh, Leone Voite, who is now, I believe, a servant of God, a great conventual Franciscan theologian, died in the um, early 70s, I think about 1974, um, whose cause is, uh, is underway. Uh, in conversation with St. Maximilian, he reports St. Maximilian saying that really uh, nothing has been said yet about Mary in comparison to what will be said and not just what will be said theologically, but the victories that she will uh, achieve. Kind of hearkening back to the, the twin um, momentous uh, theological events of Lourdes where Mary Otto defines herself as I am the Immaculate Conception and then the, the apparition at Fatima prophesying the triumph of the Immaculate Heart following uh, uh, a period of the spread of uh, atheistic and materialistic um, antichristic philosophies. Um, 
I think uh, St. Maximilian is clearly uh, in this conversation that uh, apparently took place in 1937, uh, referring or in the background thinking uh, to uh, the definition, the apparitions at Lourdes to St. Bernadette, but also the prophecies of, the, uh, of Our Lady at Fatima, uh, of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. And so, you know, if theology has to be reframed or integrated more fully, on the basis of the insights of the primacy of charity, the absolute primacy and the Immaculate Conception. And then there is a, a, a new emphasis or prioritization, a new focus on Mariology as such. This also then will have ramifications uh, on the understanding of the mission, especially that Franciscans have. And then Franciscans as members of the MI extending to the broader, uh, family of the MI into the life of the church? How, how do we understand the Franciscan vocation in the life of the church in a practical way? And then how do we get there? How do we move from philosophy, the study of history, uh, the study of uh, apologetical topics to theology, Mariology, and mission? And so this is, this is what uh, St. Maximilian is trying to bring together. And although he never uh, fulfilled or accomplished his, his intention. Nevertheless, uh, as Father Peter shows, the, the writings and the outlines that he did leave us uh, are sufficient to, in a sense, put flesh in, on the bones of the, the uh, skeleton, the, the, the mission and um, mission-oriented skeleton that uh, St. Maximilian left us in his writings, but also not just flesh and blood, but also uh, a kind of living circulatory system through understanding the theological antecedents and movements in the Franciscan tradition uh, being now present, uh, actu presently actualized through uh, an appropriation, a direct appropriation through what uh, St. Maximilian, Maximilian advocated in, in terms of Marian consecration. So that's the Holy Spirit blowing in and through this project that is uh, to be understood as a leaven in the church and uh, a means of renewal in the church through the um, full application and deeper understanding of who Our Lady is in relation to the church, in relation to the church's uh, mission. <clears throat> so uh, to sum up then, to, to understand the order of intention in St. Maximilian is very much in line with the prioritization of charity and the ends that charity has in terms of um, trying to understand the purpose for why an intelligent agent would act. This is uh, following Duns Scotus, uh, the, an intelligent agent always wills the end and then situates and orders the means to accomplish that end. So, but, but the end is what is determinative of our understanding of the motives or reason why. So the intention then of St. Maximilian allows for, and the, Father Peter will get to this uh, in more detail in the following chapter, it allows for an evaluation of the merits of St. Maximilian's project in the light of both his supporters and his critics. Uh, and his supporters will argue that St. Maximilian was a genuine theologian. He wasn't just a pious journalist or a spiritual writer they will say that, no, he had valid credentials and valid insights, and he had a truly theological methodology that qualifies him as a professional theologian, but more in the mode of a saint theologian of the, of the style of uh, John Henry Newman or Thomas Aquinas or Bonaventure or John Duns Scotus, uh, one who could engage in the speculative, but the speculative for the sake of the contemplative, and the contemplative both internally and externally, contemplative as sanctification and union, but also uh, the contemplative as an impetus for further activity and um, application and integration of these insights into one's daily life and interaction with uh, both believers and non-believers. And so uh, Father Peter lays out some key early witnesses that shows that there's a certain continuity of intention from the outset. And these, these important notes of continuity, you might call, or connections that 
bring together and unify St. Maximilian's entire project, book project, but also uh, gives us insight into the motivations of his life uh, as, as a founder of the Cities of the Immaculate, as a missionary, and then finally as a martyr in Auschwitz. And these are the emphasis from the very beginning on the strong devotion to the Franciscan uh, cause, which now became the doctrine of the church and the cause of the entire church of the Immaculate, understanding who that Immaculate is. And then in relation, especially to the Franciscan family, and here he's thinking specifically of the conventual Franciscans, because um, as Father Peter argues in other places, and St. Maximilian would have taken this um, to heart and agreed with this assessment, the Franciscan, the conventional Franciscan family is taken commonly to be the first Franciscan family and to be the original, if not the largest Franciscan family. So the conventuals he sees as uniquely in place to continue uh, the, the mission of St. Francis under the mantle of the primary patron of the order, the Immaculate Conception, to articulate what it means for Mary to have been firstborn daughter of the Father, spouse of the Holy Spirit, and mother of the Son, and for her to then be in this unique relation to the three persons of the Trinity, a kind of, as St. Maximilian would call, quasi part of the Trinity, how this reality of the Immaculate then becomes integrated and realized in the Virgo, Virgo Ecclesia Facta, the Virgin become church. How, how, does, how do we understand this? And so St. Maximilian says and believes that there's a continuous line of emphasis with respect to the Immaculate and the church as uh, profiled in a bridal sense on the new Eve. So you have the Immaculate as Virgin Mother, or virgin earth, and you have immaculate as bridal new Eve. And so these twin mysteries, St. Maximilian is trying to bring together and he sees the Franciscan family, this is their unifying cause. And then how does this work out today uh, in his context? And this is where he then opens up on his project for study, study of theology, history, uh, and philosophy and apologetics with an eye both to deepening understanding, but also taking that understanding to the world. And here's where the MI and this new mode of study, these cities of the Immaculate and academies of the Immaculate are to work hand in glove or within the context of a set of Franciscans within these religious houses, uh, totally consecrated to Mary. And this consecration being the kind of internal guiding principle of their study and of their um, evangelistic uh, projects. So you have these early connections, this kind of thread, this unifying thread of the, of the Franciscan family from its beginning that should serve to bring all the Franciscan families or all the branches of the Franciscan family into a, a kind of cause or unity of cause and development and really work towards an ultimate reconciliation and unity. Um, this is what St. Maximilian advocates and uh, informs his approach to Franciscan history, the history of the church and um, the question of the, the position of Mary in relation to the primacy of charity, the absolute predestination, divine maternity, and immaculate conception. He sees those are, are the key emphasis, emphases that um, should govern inquiry. And Father Peter rightly uh, brings this forward and gives us a clear insight into how St. Maximilian thought about these things and what his, what his desires were. As to uh, qualifications, uh, which is the other side, so to speak, of proving that St. Maximilian really did have uh, standing in the theological world is the fact that he had uh, a doctorate of philosophy. And um, I didn't double check this, but I'm quite certain it was from the Gregorianum. And he had a doctorate in theology from the Seraphicum. And early on, already in the 20s, 
it was recognized that he had a certain uh, penchant for speculative thought and research, both with respect to uh, philosophy, church history, and theology, but also in, in uh, various scientific fields. And you can see some of the illustrations and diagrams uh, of experimental models that uh, St. Maximilian left us in his um, the collected writings, the two big volumes that were just translated into English and published uh, a couple of years ago. And so uh, many people thought that he had very little aptitude for uh, practical governance, uh, ironically, because uh, he became the uh, director of several large communities throughout his life, as uh, you all would know uh, very well. So, so much for uh, general comments on the order of intention. Let's move to um, early characteristics of Colby. And sometimes uh, so on some of these questions, I'll just uh, have recourse to what Father Peter wrote. And I didn't exact, I didn't map this out all perfectly. Um, but uh, going back to the previous slide, we'll just read a um, comment from his uh, future provincial. And this is on page 12, Father Anselm Kubit. Uh, and the same Father Anselm Kubit, as we'll find later on, will um, be the provincial that places St. Maximilian under obedience to write uh, St. Maximilian's projected book on the uh, Immaculate. Uh, Father Anselm, though, writes uh, in 19, early on in 1924, that uh, St. Maximilian was especially gifted to become a philosopher rather than a practical man, a very devout religious who seemed destined to write a profoundly philosophical study, but also someone practically or absolutely unfit for practical affairs. Um, <clears throat> and actually, I think this is a later date, but this is confirmed early on in uh, a letter to uh, his brother, Alphonsus, which we will look at in terms of his uh, penchant for uh, speculative thought and the academic world. Um, now, here's, some, here's a, some key points. So the early characteristics of Scotus was he did have a, a, specula a speculative bent. But as Father Peter points out, there are several characteristics which um, indicate that the speculative bent of Colby was not understood uh, in terms of seeing theology or philosophical thought or research as an end in itself. Uh, following St. Bonaventure, and this is a key aspect of St. Bonaventure's thought in, in terms of the uh, triple way, but also the itinerarium mentis and deum, and uh, the uh, Christus unus omnium magister. Uh, and you'll see this throughout St. Throughout Bonaventure's writing, uh, but those those are some of the key texts which uh, exemplify this. Also, the uh, on the reduction of the of the arts to theology, they understand, or Saint Bonaventure lays out the um, the way in which Franciscans are to approach uh, the academic pursuits. And here, Saint Bonaventure follows the letter of Saint Francis to Saint Anthony when Saint Anthony inquired. Uh, with the uh, Seraphic Father about the teaching of theology. And St. Francis's answer essentially was, I'm very happy for you to teach theology, as long as the spirit of piety is preserved and idle curiosity is avoided. Now I'm paraphrasing, I, uh, but I think that's uh, basically how he uh, outlined it. And St. Bonaventure was the theologian par excellence who took this mandate of St. Francis and fully incorporated this mandate and integrated this mandate of the spirit of piety and the opposite of curiosity into uh, theological study. And this is then understood and manifests itself in seeing theological and philosophical study primarily not for the sake of uh, discovering new truths or finding answers, to questions, but as uh, an element or a process of intellectual asceticism by which one, through that process of self-abnegation, uh, this term will come up later, uh, annihilation through consecration and association and invocation of the spirit of the sun, 
the Holy Spirit of the Son, who is the one teacher of all. Um, it's a process of purification in order that the intellect, as a perfection of the created person, is sanctified. And how is that? How, how is the perfection of the intellect achieved? Well, it's not achieved as an end in itself, because remember, as we said in earlier lectures, the intellect, according to St. Bonaventure, is in a sense the mediating power or perfection, or it's a power suspended between memory and will, as faith is in a sense suspended between hope and charity, as the son is the middle person between the Father and the Spirit. So the intellect and academic theology, taking again these, this triadic schema, academic theology is suspended or the mediating principle between, remember symbolic theology, the source of theology and contemplative theology. And so sanctification is achieved through wisdom and wisdom, according to St. Bonaventure, is accomplished in knowledge, whether revealed or acquired, um, whether infused or acquired, I should say, whether revealed or natural, uh, is perfected and situated in charity. And so we see then the intellect has a speculative purpose and end, but the end of the intellect isn't found in the intellect itself. The end of the intellect is found in its perfection in union through charity. And then union completes the circle, uniting what we know in what we love back to what we've hoped for, what is the ground of, 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 of our um, theological journey. So St. Maximilian, as Father Peter points out, very early on understood that study was not for the sake of idle curiosity. It was for the sake of the sanctification of the intellect. And through his insights, following the golden thread, and as he sees the Franciscan history turning upon the two pages from the, the account of the Immaculate in terms of its up to its definition, turning to the second page, the incorporation of the Immaculate into the life of the church, beginning first in himself and then in those around him in the Franciscan order and throughout the Franciscan order, throughout the church, throughout the world. His understanding of the sanctification of the intellect is closely related and rooted back in that insight of St. Francis as Mary of Mary as spouse of the Holy Spirit. And this will be filtered in Bonaventurian language through his, the, his through St. Bonaventure's understanding of Mary's role as co-redemptrix and especially mediatrix of all graces, which for St. Bonaventure, the co-redemptrix has to do with the priestly analogate in Mary, um, which has to do with Mary giving of her substance, that which would become the body the flesh of the God-man himself and her medi mediatory office corresponds to her queenly role. She is in a position of authority to dispense the graces in and with and under her son because precisely she is the queen of the, um, the recapitulated, created and supernatural orders. And this again is mediated through the teaching office that Mary has in influencing the church in general as the church profiling Mary, but also the church in becoming ever more conformed to the image of her spouse, the son. And so Mary has a teaching role. So what we need then to understand is that the sanctification of the intellect has to move through a Marianization of the intellect because in the economy of salvation, Mary always maintains this pivotal role in each of its phases. And so uh, St. Maximilian then was able to connect the, uh, at, at least as Father Peter rightly, in my opinion, explained St. Maximilian, he was rightly able to connect the insights of St. Bonaventure following St. Francis on the need for intellectual asceticism and a resituating of the academic um, endeavor in and through asceticism to achieve sanctification of the intellect through precisely through a Marianization of the intellect by understanding who Mary is in terms of her immaculate conception, her divine maternity, and her uh, ultimate triumph in terms of the, uh, the triumph of the immaculate heart.
to bring forth the kingdom of the Sacred Heart. So some key early uh, landmarks. I've already mentioned um, <clears throat> the uh, speculative thought in the Kubit letter. Uh, a couple of uh, a couple of other important art pieces to note, and you know, perhaps for the sake of those who don't um, have the book, it might be good to look at some of these early articles. And I, I have the I have the originals here uh, because what we find here is that all the, all the way back in these early documents of 1924, but also uh, the later 1933 uh, circular to his Franciscan confreres, St. Maximilian is already uh, giving indication of these insights. And so what I will do then with respect to the, the MI and its relation to the Franciscan order uh, in itself and in the church at large. Um, and it, it's interesting because this was this, this, uh, this 1933, uh, circular to the seminarians of the Order of the Friars Minor Conventual. It touches upon many aspects, not just relating to the, the MI and the Franciscans, but it also relates to the, the actuality or the present necessity of every generation uh, achieving and being opened, open to and disposed to achieving the fullest uh, purposes of what God wills for that generation, and thus implying uh, a willingness to read the signs of the, of the times, to hold fast, to test everything, to hold fast to what is good, and to understand uh, a process of doctrinal and um, institutional development within continuity. So St. Maximilian is already anticipating the the hermeneutic of continuity that Pope Benedict uh, XVI would put down. And I will just read this. Um, and this is from, I'll read some sections from uh, the works of Colby 486. St. Maximilian writes, every generation has to add its own hard work and the fruits of that effort to those of previous generations. This, the same very much happens in the life of the religious, of a religious order and in ours as well. Here, it's interesting, uh, you may note that, and St. Maximilian certainly would have been aware of this, uh, Bonaventure said that the works of Christ always go forward, never backwards. Now, I think what he means by this, in terms of the, the order of the saints and the development and maturing of the church, this is something that always progresses um, throughout the ages, notwithstanding um, certain detours and certain uh, regressive movements at the same time. But I think the overall importance is understanding that the work of Christ is always something being perfected and uh, increasing in the history of the world. And a second key point that St. Maximilian very likely would have been aware of uh, is a statement from John Scotus, where he says that the knowledge of Christ increases in every generation. So what you have here is you have a certain recognition, a clear recognition that as the church moves forward and matures and its saints and its authentic magisterium reflects upon the deposit of faith, there will be a development in continuity, uh, a development that St. John Henry Newman uh, tried to articulate and which eventually brought him into the church. And Father Peter is um, in his entire work and also in his understanding of St. Maximilian, bringing these thoughts to bear is that there is a place for development in continuity precisely in order to be practical. Practical not in, in, in a pragmatic sense, let's just get it done, do something, but practical in the sense of being the most reasonable thing that God wills for his church right now and for uh, the individuals uh, that he loves in his church and who are consecrated to his service. So going on with the quote, it is to be said, and here's an interesting observation, it is, it, is, it is to be said that the further a religious order is removed from its founder, the weaker it becomes. And this is what often happens, yet it, not, yet it need not necessarily be like that. For the spirit does not know the material laws of aging, but must evolve without limit. In addition, it is no sign of humility, for instance, to pray to Father St. Francis that he may obtain for us a part of his love toward God, or 
a love equal to his. Our Holy Father will be perfectly happy only when, through his intercession, we ask for a greater love for God than his, indeed an infinitely greater. And he wants his spirit to evolve in his children and not to set his own holiness as a stopping point, as the limit of perfection. The germ he placed in our order must evolve without limitation. So there's, there's very interesting observations about continuity and development and uh, practicality. And so for those who uh, want to say that uh, St. Maximilian is using language of mere pious journalism or a language of lifeless and dead essentialism, I, I think this one uh, entry or one circular uh, gives the lie to that assertion. Clearly St. Maximilian was aware of the need to continue to deepen in order precisely to flourish deepen and develop in order to uh, precisely to flourish as an order and as um, fulfilling the mission of the church. So going on, from the dawn of our order for seven centuries, the golden thread of the cause of the Immaculate has constantly evolved. We fought for, our, we fought for recognition in the truth of the Immaculate conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Our fight ended in victory. This truth is recognized worldwide as, and, and, has, and has been declared a dogma of faith. And now he brings it to the point. And now, has that cause possibly come to an end? Could we, be, could we be content with just drawing the plan of the house without ever trying to carry it out? Rather, is it not true that the plan is laid out only because it is a prerequisite for building the house itself? And then he, he pivots. There opens the second page of our history history then, namely, to sow that truth into the heart of all those who live and will live until the end of time, and to ensure that growth and the fruits of sanctification, to in introduce the Immaculata into the hearts of men, so that she may erect in them the, the throne of her son, lead them to the knowledge of him, and inflame them with the love toward his most sacred heart. And he goes on to mention uh, in that Our Lady, Lady's apparition at Lourdes, and the... Um, auto definition. And we'll just read this. In her apparition in Lourdes, the Immaculata did not say, I have been immaculately conceived, but I am the immaculate conception. With that, she determines not only the fact of the immaculate conception, but also the way in which that privilege belongs to her. Therefore, it is not some kind of casual feature, but a part of her very nature. She herself is the immaculate conception. As a result, she is in such a excuse me, as a result, she is such in us as well and transforms us into herself as immaculate beings. She is the mother of God and also the mother of God within us and makes us gods with a little g and mothers of God who generate Jesus Christ in the souls of men. How sublime. And in the next paragraph, uh, St. Maximilian explains the role of charity and the primacy of the will. But the, the point here is, is in these early, uh, early, early writings, you see uh, a unity of thought in terms of the unity of the order with the cause of the Immaculate as understood in terms of the golden thread guiding the order um, and the pivoting or turning uh, on, on the question of the two pages. The first page being the cause for the Immaculate in terms of the definition, but the second page and what St. Maximilian understands as the more important page is the integration of the Immaculate Conception into the life of the church and into the life and hearts of believers. And here he understands, and this is perfectly Bonaventurian, perfectly Scotistic, especially the great 17th century Scotists, uh, there's a unity in the economy of salvation between the bringing forth of the God-man and the spiritual development of the God-man. Both are through and in uh, terms of a Marian mode. A second key point that I think is, is, is important to understand with respect to the Immaculate is the, um, the auto definition of I am the Immaculate Conception. And we will have to go into this a little bit in, in much greater depth uh, in, in later lectures. But the, the important thing here is, is that St. Maximilian is again an authentic uh, Franciscan in understanding the relationship between nature and grace. And so uh, there's, there's a different metaphysical account that will make sense of what St. Maximilian understands that he's taking directly from the words of 
Our Lady herself as I am the Immaculate Conception, not as I was conceived. So he's saying there's, there's a deeper truth that although the Immaculate Conception is contingent, it's not necessary for Our Lady to be human. Ne nevertheless, there is a kind of um, contingent essentiality of her being filled with grace and situated in the what he, what uh, later Franciscans call the order of the hypostatic union, to be predestined in one and the same decree with her son as the primary term of the intentions of God at extra. This has a deeper meaning than just saying um, grace is is an accidental perfection. No, it has it has a deeper. Although it is an accident in the strict sense, it doesn't exactly map onto Aristotelian notions of accidents, like you know, my hair is long, I cut it, now it's short, that sort of thing. Um, it has a deeper, it has a deeper kind of root, and this is rooted again in the prioritizing of charity in the will in the Franciscan tradition and the understanding of the relation of the soul and its powers and the soul to grace and how grace perfects and brings about a relation of the Holy Spirit and indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the life of the soul that is not exactly the same as what you might call an Aristotelian accident, although it is still contingent. It's not something essential in the terms in terms of the ontology or 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 whatness or qualitative makeup of Mary as human. Nevertheless, it's something much deeper and more important than a mere uh, Aristotelian accident. But we'll have to go into that a little bit uh, later when we get to that. But it's just, it's just important to uh, highlight that point and say, look out for it because it's coming again. Uh, a second, uh, an another important aspect after the unity of the order and the golden thread is this notion of spiritual development. And uh, summing up, then we might say, Clearly, this early text, uh, 1933, but also some of these uh, earlier mentions. Uh, you can find this on page 12 in Father Peter's uh, Theologian. Give a clear indication of the early and continuous understanding of what would become the book project, but the book project to be a, a practical guide and outline to uh, the, the mission and work of the MI as such, and the Franciscan order. Um, <clears throat> Father Alphonsus Colby gives us witness of the first um, mention of a book project. And again, this is very important, given what we've already said about uh, St. Maximilian's understanding and disposition to, understanding of and disposition towards speculation, but speculation as an ascetical endeavor for the sanctification precisely through the Marianization of the intellect. The, the notion or mention of a book project first appears in his uh, brother's uh, diary entry from 1928. Um, it gives the overall vision and scope of the book project and it specifically mentions the need for an updated Mariology as well as an entirety of dogmatic theology that, that integrates these aspects. Now. Um, Father, Peter, uh, Father uh, St. Maximilian, excuse me, clearly had the vision and understood the need to integrate this. And I would argue, I would contend that even though he never wrote a continuous series of dogmatic theology, that which Father Peter did write um, is the closest thing we are likely to come up with or, or discover of the fulfillment of this kind of updating to Mariology and full integration of Mariology into and with dogmatic theology, not just dogmatic theology, but also uh, very important philosophical questions. And so Father Peter is one who uniquely was equipped and situated with his encyclopedic understanding of, of church history, uh, the witness of the fathers of scripture, and also and especially the um, Franciscan tradition up through uh, not just not just uh, the big names Saint Francis uh, Bonaventure Scotus but a lot of lesser known names especially appearing in the 17th century uh, figures like um, Bartolomeus uh, Mastrius uh, Bonaventura Baluto 
um, uh, Angelus uh, Vulpes, um, Carlos uh, de Moral, um, Salvatore uh, Montalbanus, all these, all these brilliant, brilliant uh, authors during the golden age of Scotism, Father Peter uh, knew and um, actually referenced. And this was uh, able to be accomplished through his time and work at the Seraphicum, but also uh, one must remember that he was uh, a librarian at Rensselaer Seminary for years and assembled probably the premier Franciscan library in the world. And uh, at one point in the early 1980s, he had uh, initiated a project to republish a lot of these 17th century uh, Franciscan figures. And so um, just, to, just to point out that Father Peter is, these comments are simply to point out that Father Peter had a, uh, a massive knowledge of the tradition beyond what necessarily he's able to mention. Uh, if he were to constantly cite his sources, uh, his books would have uh, and essays would have been even longer and his apparatus uh, completely unwieldy. So uh, couple all of his knowledge of the history of theology and uh, the history of the church with his knowledge and interaction with the Second Vatican Council and magisterial teachings leading up to and subsequent to that council. Uh, Father Peter was in a unique position to carry out uh, quite successfully, if not f in a fully complete sense, the this project for an updated Mariology and an integrated dogmatic theology. Uh, getting back to St. Maximilian, though, uh, in this entry, in addition to the updates in theology, he wanted a theology to also take into account the latest developments of science in relationship with and in conversation with the the facts of miracles as well and clearly for saint maximilian two miracles were very important one being the apparition at uh lords in the late 1850s and then the second being the apparitions uh in and around fatima And the latter two, uh, the developments in science and miracles, had precisely uh, an evangelical and apologetic thrust uh, for uh, St. Maximilian. We mentioned this earlier uh, in 1933, St. Maximilian uh, mentions his desire to found a Marian Academy, a Marian Academy precisely to deepen our knowledge of uh, and reflection upon Mary's place in the economy of salvation, the implications of her immaculate conception and divine maternity for the entire uh, scope of creation and recreation, and precisely to publish uh, popular and scholarly works and perhaps even award uh, doctoral degrees. And up to this point, during the time of St. Maximilian, uh, doctoral degrees in theology weren't uh, given in, in Mariology, uh, from what I understand. So St. Maximilian was a visionary on this point as well. Uh, but you can see his focus. And, and then I've already mentioned that 1937 conversation with, uh, reported by uh, Leone Voite, uh, his Franciscan confrere. Voite basically summed up his conversation of uh, St. Maximilian as St. Maximilian being very learned and very pious, uh, very able. But what really struck Voite was Maximilian's comment that up till now, everything that's been said is absolutely nothing. All the rest is still to be said about Mary. She will enjoy tri triumphs as yet unheard of. And this is precisely as St. Maximilian understands it through the means of the, um, the MI as the leading edge of those totally consecrated to Mary <clears throat> and the incorporation of the Immaculate Conception into the life of the church in terms of church renewal. So in a sense, the, the full unification of the uh, institutional, dogmatic, and sacramental with the pneumatic and charismatic elements that um, bring together a, a kind of personal actuality or presencing, not just habitually, but in act, wherein every act to, our, to the extent that is humanly possible, is carried out for the intention of bringing about the, uh, the kingdom of the Sacred Heart of Jesus to the glory of the Father. Uh, 1933, we go back to that, uh, lec that uh, circular from, uh, from Colby to the, to the um, 
conventional Franciscan seminarians, we find an outline of the MI. And basically, uh, there, there are a couple key points. One, he, he wanted there to be a circle of the MI in every Franciscan college. Who were the, and this circle was to be comprised of those who freely consecrate themselves to the Immaculate. So, so St. Maximilian understood that total consecration, even within the context of the Franciscan order, has to be something that's entered into freely. It can't be coerced. It can't be made a condition of membership in the order. Uh, per se. Uh, it was more to be understood as uh, uh, something freely entered into and um, something to be encouraged and hopefully the very the very goodness of the consecration and the fruits, the spiritual fruits of the consecration would be a motivation and impetus for everyone to uh, consecrate themselves to the Immaculate. And then in terms of the MI, in the meetings of the MI, the members would then be trained to live and work in the spirit of the MI. So basically uh, this would entail uh, consecration and then study of the cause of the Immaculate in terms of its dogmatic, philosophical and historical import in terms of the uh, Franciscan order, in terms of the church and in terms of mission and evangelization. Uh, there's also a component of studying anti-religious movements. And for St. Maximilian, it would be the philosophical context of Kant Kantianism, Hegelianism, uh, secret societies such as the Freemasons, but also and especially um, the, uh, the thought and um, effects of the writings of Karl Marx. Uh, remember, the uh, revolution uh, was fairly recent in history. Uh, the Revolution in uh, the October Revolution in Russia in 1933, and uh, it's interesting at the same year in 1917 you have the apparitions at Fatima, but also you have the um, Masonic march in Rome that Saint Maximilian was witness to, and so this these these three this threefold um, kind of anti-Christic uh, movement is and was uh, a strong impetus for the foundation of the. Um, the Militia Immaculate. And so then what St. Maximilian understood, and here's where the uh, emphasis on the practicality again of theology and the consecration uh, to Mary and the mode of life in the, what, will, would, what would become the city of the Immaculate uh, is very practical. Uh, there's a, there's these, these, the study and this work on the intellectual level is to be carried out in practical action. And not just practical action to the present, but also uh, a continuous planning on how to act and move forward that, that kind of spiritual evolution that he, or development that St. Maximilian talked about earlier in the same letter uh, is to be ongoing and continuous. So there's, there's a, a facility in responding and anticipating uh, the, the the needs of the cause of the Immaculate, but also the various objections and obstacles that would be placed in front of that cause through, through anti-religious movements and uh, anti-Marian movements, both in and outside the church. <clears throat> we, uh, we've already mentioned this, but this is supported uh, a little bit further in um, number 486. Uh, important, some important things to note is, uh, and I've already mentioned this, Kant, Hegel, secret societies, and Marx, uh, and then the importance of Our Lady uh, of Lords, Our Lady at Lords for St. Maximilian. I am the Immaculate Conception. Um, Father Peter understands this, and this has been confirmed by a couple of uh, Capuchin scholars that this seems to be an instance of infused contem contemplation, how he uh, comes to an understanding of uh, Mary as in her self-declaration at Lords, but also in his statements about her relation to the Trinity, that there's this, this, is, this is something that is virtually inexplicable, uh, understood in its own light. And so there must have been some sort of infused contemplation that would have bolstered or uh, informed or influenced St. Maximilian's insights. Uh, important to note here that he's following again, uh, Bonaventure and Scotus, at least implicitly. And we already know that he um, 
Saint Maximilian, that is, uh, gave a great deal of attention to volume five of the uh, Opera Omnia of Saint Bonaventure, the Koraki edition, which contains a great deal on the topic of Marian mediation. And he also uh, read virtually everything written uh, by Scotus on Our Lady. And so we find then what's being discussed here is a, a ref re refraction or a reflection of what Bonaventure and Scotus had to say on Mary as mediatrix and Mary as immaculately conceived, uh, Bonaventure and Scotus respectively. And then finally culminating in a contemplative and missionary uh, emphasis, the character and life of the church. Um, along with this, the, the issue of transubstantiation into the Holy Spirit and the Immaculate is raised around the same time in a conference of Colby and then also in another uh, diagram given in a writing from 1937. And the importance here is that he does, there is a link clearly and, and Maximilian was intending to make this point. And this, this point here feeds back into what I mentioned earlier about Mary's auto definition of I am the Immaculate Conception being something contingent, yet something more than just an Aristotelian accident. It relates to this. Um, because in some sense, in a real sense, St. Maximilian is arguing that Mary's auto definition of I am the Immaculate Conception already entails a kind of transubstantiation of Mary herself into the Holy Spirit. And by transubstantiation here, uh, we're, we're referring to a transformation at a deep level or perhaps the deepest level of her created reality. But it's not a transubstantiation as occurs in the um, Eucharistic sacrifice through the consecration of the elements in terms of the total conversion of the natural substance of bread and wine into the substance of the body and blood of our Lord. It's rather a total transformation or conversion, not of the natural substance, but of the will of our lady in conformity, in acceptance of the will of the father as manifested or appropriated to the Holy Spirit in terms of the Trinity's common work ad extra. So this transubstantiation that Colby is speaking of has an analogy to the physical or natural transubstantiation that one speaks of in terms of the Eucharist, but it is unlike, it's essentially different insofar as what is being spoken of in terms of transubstantiation into the Holy Spirit and the Immaculate is not on the order of nature, but on the order of person or will. And it takes on an entirely different character because on the, or the order in the order of nature or person, we're not dealing with inert or sub-rational entities. We're actually dealing with the perfection, the full divinization of uh, a created rational nature. And so there is a transubstantiation, a deepen, a, a, a perfection from within of the person of Mary, but it's not a changing of Mary from what she was by nature to something other than that. It's rather a perfection and elevation, a perfect and unimaginably, unimaginably perfect elevation in terms of her will, her will that is acting and perfected in charity, charity, which is primarily a love of God for his own sake. Remember the uh, affectio justitiae, uh, this, this love of the good for its own sake. Well, Mary is perfectly that, and her will is perfectly transubstantiated into the will of God through her union with the Holy Spirit. There's an identity of will and thus a perfect union between persons, and thus a true transformation of who Mary is from within, in her very soul, in her very essence, without that essence ceasing to be human and created. And so St. Maximilian will speak of then possession, but it's possession as a recapitulation. Remember, we spoke about recapitulation. It's a possession as a recapitulation, not in Mary's case, from um, a state of sin or dominion of Satan, but a, but, a, but a recapitulation in terms of a complete recognition and ordering of Mary through the Spirit under the headship of her son from the very first moment of her existence, where 
whereas we experience this possession by the Holy Spirit subsequent to our being brought about in original sin and committing actual sins, and then having a redemption and a purification and this possession through transubstantiation into the spirit and the Immaculate Mary is this in her very person. Um, so there's a possession, but a possession in terms of perfect loving union of wills, where Jesus himself said, Jesus, who is God, a divine person, he says, remember, my meat is to do the will of my father. That was also Mary's meat, to do the will of her heavenly father as firstborn daughter of the father in bringing forth the God-man as spouse of the Holy Spirit. And it's precisely the Holy Spirit that gives the capacity to make the will, doing the will of the Father, the sole sustenance, the spiritual, personal sustenance of, 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 of all those who are adopted or naturally as sons. Remember, the Holy Spirit was given to Christ and Christ in John, I think, chapter three or four gives the spirit without measure. This is what we're talking about. Possession as recapitulation. And then when we understand annihilation, and we'll get again into annihilation a little bit more deeply, uh, it has deep resonance with both, as, far as, as Brother Charles mentioned last week, to the understanding of the Eucharistic sacrifice and the Eucharistic transformation of the elements. It has a very close... Um, it, that, that reality helps us understand what we mean by annihilation in the Franciscan scotistic framework on the one hand, and it also has a close relationship to, and it's essential to understand for understanding St. Maximilian's thought on annihilation, it's essential to understand Scotus's definition of what a person is. And we will get to both of those questions in future lessons, but I'm just signposting those. In order to, to understand possession and annihilation, uh, Take away these two points. Possession is recapitulation. It's, it's, it's a perfectly free synergy. And the Franciscans have worked out what, are, what is called the condetermination or the essentially ordered co-causes in a manner that is different than either the Thomistic, the traditional Thomistic uh, understanding or the Jesuit understanding uh, where you have physical pre-motion where God is, in a sense, it's very difficult to distinguish between God's action and human action. God's action seems to just radically determine all human action. That's the physical pre-motion theory of someone like Banyas following, I think, St. Thomas more consistently. Or you have what's known, no, understood in the Jesuit tradition, many Jesuits taking this on, the position of uh, Molina, which is called middle knowledge, wherein there's God's knowledge of his will as determined, and then there's God's knowledge of of all things, all things in general. And then there's a middle knowledge of, 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 a, of a space in God's knowledge where he knows what created agents would do before he wills that they actually exist. So there's there's a kind of third place. And this is what God called that this is what Molina calls middle knowledge. And this is he tried to avoid the seemingly deterministic uh, account of Thomas and Banyas. Uh, this is this was a solution. Well, the Franciscans didn't go for any of these, and instead, following Duns Scotus, they developed a theory of condetermination based upon an understanding of essentially ordered co-causes. And essentially ordered co-causes are simply two causes that work together in unison, that are both essential in producing and in fact do produce a single effect. And the paradigmatic example for essentially ordered co-causes that will help us understand too the operation of the spirit and the created person in the spiritual life is that relationship between man and woman in recording, in, 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 in producing a child. Because both principles, the masculine and the feminine principles are absolutely necessary and essential for producing one effect, the child. And no intensification of either the masculine principle or the feminine principle is going to produce a child. You need both principles. So they're ordered and they're both essential, meaning ordered, co-essential causes to produce one effect. And this is the model that Scotus develops that then he applies by analogy to the spiritual life. There is an essentially ordered co-causality between the spirit's action and you attribute the supernaturality of 
the actions of the created person to the spirit, but the spirit is operating in a co-essentially and ordered way with the created person, the person accepting and acting out through his or her powers of loving and willing to act in accordance with the spirit. And you attribute the, but it produces one, one effect, one effect of a sanctified human person. And so this understanding of possession and annihilation have to be understood and rooted in the mystery of the will and charity in the paradigm of scotistic metaphysics of essentially ordered co-causes and thus con-determination. Um, if you want to see an analogate in the physical order or the intellectual order, the natural order, what I mean is look at St. Bonaventure's disputed questions on the knowledge of Christ question four. What later Scotists in the 17th century, like Mastrias and Volpes, articulated in terms of condetermination with respect to uh, divine freedom and created freedom, St. Bonaventure already articulated in the intellectual sphere with his theory of divine illumination. It's the same kind of uh, essentially ordered co-causality, and it's something that the Franciscans have to offer, which I believe is objectively more in concert with the great Eastern Fathers. Uh, but it's something that is a corrective, a clarification. It's a, it's a true third way that avoids a lot of the difficulties that you find in uh, the Thomism expressed by, say, Garigou Lagrange on the one hand, or the Thomism expressed by Jesuit theorists uh, like uh, Molina, or uh, in different ways, Suarez or St. Robert uh, Bellarmine. Uh, okay, so, you know, enough on that. But I'm just, again, we'll get into this a, a bit deeper uh, when we have opportunity where Father Peter directly addresses it. Uh, then uh, trans so you have transubstantiation, and then Mary in relation to the Trinity. And basically this diagram comes from a, uh, a talk that uh, St. Maximilian gave in 1937. And what you see is, you know, the, the, evil, the evil triangle of the Trinity, which is not a very good image, but it's one that's used. And the point here is, is that you have a relation between the, the, the three persons of the Trinity. And within that, because of Mary's unique relation to each of the persons of the Trinity. Remember, St. Francis called her firstborn daughter of the Father. She is the perfect fruit of the good creation. She is the perfect response and re reality of the creator spirit. She's the firstborn daughter of the Father. She's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. And of course, what we mean by spouse is simply that union, that perfect, unimaginable supernatural union of will in charity between God and Mary. She's spouse of the Holy Spirit, metaphorically speaking, and she's mother of the Son. So she has unique relations to each of the persons of the Trinity uh, by appropriation to the Father and to the Holy Spirit and by proper relation to the Son because she's truly, and this is where uh, St. Maximilian will follow Blessed John Duns Scotus and uh, the, the Eastern tradition, especially exemplified in St. John of Damascus in saying that Christ has true two filiations, one by from the Father, by divine nature being communicated, and two in time by the mother, by the human nature. So there are two filiations in Christ, and thus the Father is really the Father of the Son, and the Holy Theotokos is really the mother of the Son. St. Thomas, St. Bonaventure will say, no, the relation that affiliation that Mary has to the son is only a relation of reason. It's not a real relation because filiation primarily uh, pertains to the person. And because the person was already constituted eternally, he can't have another filiation. Well, Scotus will just simply say, no, filiation is not determined by person. It's determined by um, the nature being communicated. And thus there's a perfect, consistent, perfect consistency in Scotus's thought. Again, Scotus here following the Eastern tradition of St. John of Damascus, uh, going against uh, uh, Bonaventure and Aquinas on this point. But what it does is it, is it brings to a perfect, the most real sense, the manner in which Mary is in relation to the Trinity, um, uniquely in relation. Um, you know, I would, I would recommend if you have, do you, I don't know if you have the volumes, uh, getting, looking at uh, the collected works, uh, some of his diary entries, because he has some beautiful reflections on the Trinity. Uh, basically, the Trinitarian basis of his whole project is it's Maximilian, St. Maximilian understood that first things must come first. The Father is the first. He's 
the source of all being. Uh, and from the Father, the divinity is eternally flowing into the Son and the Spirit. And from the Trinity, appropriated to Mary, this, the, 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 the Holy Spirit flows, excuse me, from the Trinity, appropriated to the Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit fructifies Mary and makes her mother of the man-God. And this man-God is the prototype. Now, um, look again, if you have a chance, at Father Peter's Redemption, Metaphysics, and the Immaculate Conception that he published in 2005, because Father Peter articulates this. And here he's dealing in Irenaean and Bonaventurian theology, which is ultimately a reflection of the philosophy and the theology of Scripture in terms of prototype. Pro, you have prototype, archetype, and um, antitype. And here, St. Maximilian is using prototype in terms of the, the, how Father Peter will use the word archetype, meaning archetype being the, the, the first modeling in the intention of God at extra. So Christ is the first in intention. He is the perfect model, the prototype or the archetype of the perfect holy man precisely by being the God-man. And so Mary is the mother of this God-man or man-God. And it's precisely on the model that the saints are shaped. And the saints are made into Christ precisely by conformity to Mary and the Spirit. And through that conformity, they then become like Mary, little mothers giving birth to Christ in their souls so that their soul takes on the, the model that Christ is. And this can only happen according to saint maximilian through mary but it's also but it's always rooted in the father the father who is eternally generating inspiring the spirit and temporally recapitulating that and turning that back into a direction towards himself in and through the the economy of salvation through the instrumentality of mary through this whole process <clears throat> Uh, some interesting points and important points in that same entry, but moving from Q, again, this is 1933. So 33 is an important year because you have KW 486, where he, that we've already discussed, but now you have these diary entries. So St. Maximilian is thinking about these realities. Uh, in this diary entry, he, he gives the practical goals of the MI, which we've already discussed. He emphasizes the bond of charity. And then he says, through the, the practical goals of the MI being accomplished, this bond of charity will be increased such that you can enter into the mysteries of charity and the primary mysteries, uh, the cross and the Eucharist, and thus accomplish, like Our Lady, a certain assumption of souls. So he's using um, metaphor and biblical imagery to hammer home these, these fundamental points. And it, it really creates a memorial uh, or a memorable uh, uh, way of approaching these things because you have these images of you know, the assumption of Our Lady, the ascension of Our Lord, the assumption of Our Lady. Uh, but now our souls, like Our Lady's body, are being assumed presently through the bond of charity, through deeper and deepening entry into the mystery of charity. Our souls are not only assumed upon conversion and baptism, but our souls are continuously being assumed through our everyday actions, through our um, immediate and direct practical entry into and participation in the mysteries of charity themselves, namely the cross and the Eucharist or the cross through the Eucharist, um, the continuing presence of our ascended and perfected and realized Lord in his humanity that isn't subject now to the conditions of the flesh, to suffering, but nevertheless is perfectly imminent in a sacramental mode as the Lord of creation, the Lord of history. And so uh, St. Maximilian makes these profound connections. It's not just a kind of um, separated spirituality, but St. Maximilian understands what his spirituality really is about, is about what St. Bon John Paul II wrote about. The Eucharist makes the church and the church makes the Eucharist. There's this dynamism that needs to take place. And the only way you're going to have church be church is if the bride is fully incorporated into the profile of the bride, namely Mary, but that bride precisely to be the glory and term of the bridegroom. 
until you have a relation, a spousal relation. Christ, the bridegroom, gives the Eucharist to the church. The church conforms herself through the power of the Spirit and through um, participation in that one sacrifice to the bridegroom in creating this one flesh union, this unbreakable union of the whole Christ, namely head and members, for the sake of the return to the Father in perfect Trinitarian communion. Uh, some hints, uh, early on, 1932, uh, St. Maximilian noted that he had uh, he felt an urge, a prompting, to write more about the Immaculate. In, in 1935, he mentioned uh, for the first time that he wanted to write a pamphlet about the MI precisely in order to deepen knowledge of the Immaculate. Uh, he, he, he gives a statement about Bonaventurian that indicates Bonaventurian method and goals, and I will um, just read that because I think it's important if I can find it. Let's see here. Ah, this is this is from that 1935, and this is this is a a, a statement perfectly summarizing uh, Saint Bonaventure's methodology. Methodology. Saint Maximilian writes: We should also think about deepening our knowledge of the Immaculata, knowledge of her relationship to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, to the whole to the whole Most Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ, to the angels and to us men must be deepened so that such knowledge may become brighter and brighter through humble studies enlivened by prayer. That material is inexhaustible. Uh, and finally, in this 1935 passage, um, he discusses uh, the dissemination of this pamphlet and the knowledge of the MI. And then this uh, comes to fruition in 1938 when he's requested to write a book. And this, the first work where he begins in earnest appears in uh, Colby's works, Numbers uh, two, 1224 through uh, 12229. And uh, these were, these appeared in Miles Immaculata. Now these weren't uh, completed, but what you do see, and Father Peter importantly notes, is that these articles discuss Mary as the link between finite and infinite. And remember our last um, discussion, we discussed the whole notion of the disjunctive transcendentals. So Mary as a link between finite and infinite shows forth uh, his understanding of Mary as a concrete personal pivot point locating and coordinating this transcendental just disjunct in her person. Mary as finite created person, but nevertheless as also uh, bringing forth the infinite person. So, so she, she brings herself into this discussion of uh, even philosophical metaphysics in terms of the distinction between infinite and finite. And, and uh, St. Maximilian makes that point. And this is, this is a, a key point you will find in the writings of the Eastern Greek Fathers and the Academy of the Immaculate published uh, Father Christian Kappas' book uh, on the Immaculate Conception that makes these very points. And so you find that St. Maximilian through following uh, a scotistic method ends up also echoing the, the, the theology of the great um, Eastern cosmo, cosmic Christologies, cosmic Mariologies, while at the same time incorporating and maintaining that uh, practical and um, that practical emphasis on uh, church and the questions of grace and soteriology that come from uh, St. Augustine. This this one uh, brings up, you know, I, I point this out, the nature of scotistic theology, right? Precisely in dealing with the link between finite and infinite, St. Maximilian is discussing the relationship between the two I am statements of Exodus. I am who am, Exodus 3.14 and the burning bush, and our statement at Lourdes. How, does the, how, do, how are we understanding this? And these devolve upon the absolute primacy of Jesus Christ for the sake of the glory and divinization of Christ and Mary, Christ first and Mary through Mary. But then a universal scope, the church and the world is to be caught up into uh, this reality rooted in the absolute primacy of Christ and the insights that are given through the auto definitions of the, of the God man as first revealed in Exodus 3.14, but then uh, later on with respect to Our Lady as the created immaculate conception at Lord's. And then finally, there's, uh, again, a nod to a Bonaventurian uh, method of theology proper. Uh, we've already mentioned this, though. Mary as the profile of the church. And then theology, academic theology, as suspended between 
contemplative, uh, excuse me, uh, suspended between symbolic and contemplative theology, just like intellect is dis suspended between memory and will. Um, the uh, faith is suspended between hope and charity and so on and so forth. The uh, clear uh, nod to St. Bonaventure. And then finally, the order of intention is then carried out up until December 7th, uh, 1939, uh, until his arrest in 1941. Uh, St. Maximilian continued to work on his books. This is, this is where we have a lot of the notes. And throughout this whole process, he gives witness to uh, Trinity, Incarnation, and the Immaculate. Not coming to fruition in an actual book, but actually his martyrdom as the martyr of charity. And that is that, is that for this uh, slideshow. And so, let's see here. Am I still sharing the screen? Let's stop share. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know what time it is. It's about 7.30, that took about an hour and a half. Yeah, we might have a little bit of time for questions and answers. Well, at least questions. I might not have answers. Okay, here's a an attempt at a question. <laughs> Let's turn up the volume here. Can I turn you up? Uh, we talk about the Immaculate Conception mystery in Colby. Um, I would ask him how to today, in which um, part of the theology, the mystery of the Immaculate could be more um, deepened. Uh, I would say in, it could be a kind of in, in ecclesiology, in cosmic theology, Christology, or which kind of um, new tools we have for and this understanding more the, the mystery as Kolb wanted us to do in the MI with the MI project at the end. Yeah. So is it is is the question how this could be deepened and applied? I think correct me if I'm wrong, but I think his question is is given the current state of theology with its many yeah. different yeah. focuses or appearances, methodologies, formalities. Right. Yeah. Where is Even the authors, authors. Mm -hmm. which authors? Okay, so which contemporary areas of theology? He mentioned a few being. Um, I already lost it. Like cosmic yeah, 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 yeah cosmic. Well, basically, contemporary. Where is the con contemporary yeah. discussion? Well, I think I think yeah, that's that's a big problem. It's it's a big problem, and it it it's an ecclesiological question because you, prior to the council you had you know essentially christotypical ecclesiologies or a mariologies and then you had an emphasis on ecclesial typical mariologies and what that the, the problem simply with that is that uh for ec ecclesiology to function you you have to you have to be able to discuss the beginning the middle and the end of ecclesiology and so in order to fully deal with this if if the church is a mother and the 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 mother is modeled. The mothering of the church is modeled on the motherhood of God, who gave birth to head and members. You have to be able to uh, discuss ecclesiology in terms of both Christotypical, meaning the unique, um, excuse me, uh, Mariology, uh, in terms of the unique relationship that Mary has as true mother of the head. But you also have to then understand Mary as true bride of the groom. And so she fills both of those. And this is something that the fathers going all the way back to St. Irenaeus understood very clearly that Mary has a double antitypical role. One being the virgin earth. She's the antitype of the virgin earth, but two, she's also the antitype of the old Eve or the first Eve as the new Eve. And so she fills, she, you, can't, you can't explain Mariology either in a Christotypical or an ecclesial typical model. You have to have both incorporated and it's precisely through the Colbian insights and the working out of this theory that um, uh, Father Peter has engaged in 
where you can begin to order and integrate both of those things. So it's very pertinent for ecclesiology. Uh, what is the Immaculate Conception in relationship to? Well, the Immaculate Conception is the condition of becoming the Divine Mother. And what's the Divine Mother? The Mother is the one that brings forth the head and the members. And so this is directly related to ecclesiology. So ecclesiology has to be able to deal with both the Christotypical and the ecclesial typical modes of Mariology. And it's precisely through the Franciscan approach that you can integrate and order the two. You don't have to shunt one off uh, to the uh, expense or at the expense of, of, of another. So you don't have to emphasize one at the expense of another. And you bring up the issue of cosmic Christology. It's absolutely uh, pertinent. And cosmic Christology, has to do very much with ecclesiology, but ecclesiology in terms of what the church is as the purpose for creation and the church in relation to the fulfillment of creation. And so <clears throat> how do we understand Christ? How do we understand Mary? How do we understand the church? Uh, so this is both a, a dogmatic, a speculative theological question that is very important. And you, you can't understand the cosmic scope of Christ unless you understand what the church is. And you clearly can't understand Christ or the church unless you understand what Mary is as immaculate, but in, in order to be divine mother. And so this is, a, this is an important internal theological, speculative, dogmatic question, but it also is very important for ecumenical purposes because the, the, the reality of the cosmic aspects of Christology, this is, this is rooted already in the creation account of Genesis, where creation is modeled, or the types of the future temple are being modeled in creation, in the very out outline of creation. Uh, you have the temple, but then also you have the recreation of John in the first three chapters. You've got seven days, and then at the end, you have the, 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 the type of the sacrament. And so you've got institutional, and you've got cosmological things being tied together in creation and temple, and where Christ says, you know, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Well, he was speaking of the temple of his body. And so you have this, the, this, and the temple clearly is a microcosm of the cosmos, because the cosmos itself is structured as a temple in terms of those three realms. You know, you have, you have the, you have the, um, you know, the outer court, you have the, the, the holy place, and you have the holy of holies. Well, creation, if you look vertically, is structured in the same way. You have the, the land, the outer court, you have the heaven, and you have the heaven of heavens divided by a firmament, that blue line that becomes clear at night. And it's funny, the same color of the uh, linen, the, the, the veil, uh, mimics the, the, the sky. And so, yeah, I think, I think very important aspects of the, the Immaculate Conception and the Divine Maternity, uh, excuse me, aspects or these realities are very important for cosmic Christology. And this is cosmic Christology, both internally with respect to Catholic theology proper, but also in terms of ecumenism with respect to the Orthodox, especially the Byzantine Orthodox, but also the Oriental because the Byzantine Orthodox, yes, that's fine. Um, the Byzantine Orthodox, especially the later theologians and uh, brother Charles would, would, would attest to this because he, he studied some of these later figures, um, heavily emphasized uh, the cosmic aspects of Christology. And this goes all the way back to St. Irenaeus. And I don't know that Colby mentions him, but Father Peter clearly does and makes good use. So uh, ecumenical discussion with Orthodox, but also with Protestants um, in terms of understanding the, because this is becoming a, a big topic of interest in Protestant circles too, as they m move back towards becoming more metaphysical and um, ecumenical in their own theology. So yes, I think, I think uh, those two topics you raised and others are very important, but in many ways, uh, ecclesiology and Christology are the foundations for understanding and articulating any other subset. If you're talking about grace, uh, if you're talking about sacraments, so if you're talking about uh, church order, uh, all of these things will flow from uh, what, how we understand uh, questions of ecclesiology and Christology. So yeah, you hit, you hit the two foundational topics uh, precisely on, on the head there. And um, also a proper understanding and framing of uh, ecclesiology and Christology will help us, uh, will help deepen our reflection on the Trinity. Again, the, the, the formal or proper object of theology.
those are just some quick thoughts off the top of my head. But yeah, very good question. And yeah, I, you you stated you stated it where the areas of of import are. Anything else? I think you're on mute. Well, I can see you're on mute. Okay, I think I'm off mute now. Um, one thing that you touched on was um, the development of St. Maximilian. So the intention he had and then now how Father Peter sort of takes that, recapitulates it, puts it all together in the current context of the church. And as Fra Joseph Pio just asked about how in contemporary theology you, you locate the importance of this and it's at the very fountainhead of ecclesiology and Christology. One question would be, this is all ordered to praxis, the practice. Do you have any sort of speculations on what that actually looks like in our, our context? Because we're seeing, I th I'm thinking particularly when we talked about organizing an action is that, especially in your region up there in the Northeast, Northwest, there's been an awful lot of organizing and direct action on the streets of the cities. Um, <laughs> and I'm wondering just because I think in particular it's in the book of Father Anselm Ram where he comments that Saint Maximilian was very active in the sense that he, you know, as we would say in contemporary parlance, he, he was the church in exit or the church going out. Ecclesia and Ushita. Um, but then he comments that generally the, the contemporary followers of St. Maximilian have ministered more to the devout than to, and I know that's a problem we have is in our institute, we generally form, I mean, it's an important thing to form groups of devoted lay people, but it, it does sort of tend to just turn into a pious club rather than having this sort of like, uh, yeah, very take it to the streets, direct action, or not direct action, but. Um, but where do you see this when we, we talk about the practical side of this, but where do we, where, does that actually, where do we take this into action? Yeah, that, you know, that's a, that's, that's a good question. And I think it will vary uh, depending upon circumstances. But I think the criticism or the potential drawback that you raise is, is an important point. Uh, we tend to, um, I think as someone has once said, we tend to create holy huddles rather than, you know, a wide array or a formation of, uh, uh, with, with a kind of, uh, charismatic militancy uh, to uh, use those those terms um, without without having thought deeply other than you know what what because I'm you know I'm kind of an academic type plus I have seven children so a lot of time and in, in my life is spent with those in those two areas uh, but you raise you raise an important point and I, I suspect that Father Peter and Saint Maximilian would look to those those documents on the uh, on the the renewal of religious life, uh, the mission to the nations, ad gentes, um, the uh, the role of the laity, and how they're the the especially the Franciscan family through the MI or its equivalents can interface in, interface with uh, laity in terms of total consecration, and that's a, that's another topic. But uh, clearly, the MI extends beyond the. Franciscan family, but I think it gives a certain affinity to the Franciscan family, especially if St. Maximilian Colby was right. Uh, anyone who is uh, a member of the M MI is uh, not a third order Franciscan, but, you know, 
somebody who's ordered to the Franciscan uh, way of life, which I think is, is you know, in, in many ways, the gospel way of life. Uh, so yeah, practically speaking, I, I, I think what St. Maximilian lays out is, you know, teaching, uh, evangelization, apologetics, but I think what's missing, and this is the, the big problem with the Catholic Church, and I think, you know, it's, in many ways, it's the, the charismatics uh, who actually try to do something about it. It's not even so much the religious orders, by and large, who see some point in going to the streets and preaching the gospel. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that is detrimental. It's something that is a terrible, uh, I think, stain on the Catholic Church in our times is that there is an utter lack of uh, really practical evangel 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 I can't even speak. evangelization. Um, and uh, I think the practical solution is, is for those people who have the means and insofar as they have the means to just simply preach the gospel and preach the gospel, the full gospel of the divine paternity and divine maternity. I mean, you just, you just, again, I just keep saying this. If you, if you're going to be an Orthodox Christian, you say that the, the, the Jesus Christ has a divine father and he has an earthly mother. And just simply making that statement should make every jaw drop. I mean, you're going to uh, spark all sorts of interests just saying that Jesus is the son of God, but Jesus is also the son of Mary. And you say, wait a second. I mean, this, this, this is really a conversation stopper, a conversation starter. And so, you know, that full, that full uh, Christmas gospel that really roots Jesus in his roots, in the father eternally and in the mother temporally, this is what needs to be brought to the streets. And then, then everything else is spoken of in terms of that. You know, it's that hard hitting statement that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's also one of us. Right. I think that's very practical too. Can you hear me there? Yes, this yes, yes. Good to hear you. This is, I could hear you from uh, Jared. It's um, very good. Very good talk. Um, um, yeah, there seems to be a real practical element to this. Um, I, I'm finding is, is um, you know, left and the right, say the secular left and the, um, and the um, religious right. The secular left is kind of focused on man and, and um, and the uh, religious right is uh, focused on God and God alone and say the fundamentalists, especially in the Middle East are all uh, God alone. And um, so, so much so they're almost anti-human and the, um, of course the, um, the humanists on the left are all anti-God um, in the extreme sense anyways, in the extreme camps. Um, so I think um, anything that, that where um, God and um, man meet, namely in Jesus Christ and of course in, in Mary who is, um, um, where that takes place and, and prepared therefore to be and um, proves that humanity and holiness can, can coincide and that uh, left and right can coincide. And these, are, these are things that, that, that are, are almost um, impossible to, to believe today, um, both in politics and in religion. You know, that, uh, that, um, so I think there is a, um, a real um, a religious angle to the whole um, issues today. And I think... Um, um, and so the polarization today, and, and it centers on the incompatibility we, we perceive and we um, incorrectly perceive between God and man and, and, and holiness and human and humanity. And so I think um, you, know, you definitely, um, uh, where, where Mary is, you know, where infinite and finite meet is, is really, really hitting the point. And at least yeah. a practical element, yeah. even if I don't, it might not directly uh, <laughs> um, suggest um, how to march in the street or whatever. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I, I mean, it, it, what you say, I mean, I think of, I think of Pilate's words, you know, ecce homo, and, you know, this, this, whole, this whole notion of, of virtue and virtue signaling in the modern world. And I think I've mentioned it er, in earlier lectures. It's like you, you, you have the virtus without the vir. You know, you don't say, behold the man. You, you, don't, have the, you, don't, have, you don't have any concept of what man is. And so what this, what this results in, in inexorably is a profanation of charity. And you can see this in the, the, the two fundamental characteristics that Father Peter notes, notes uh, are on the individual level, the, the, the giving way to various forms of sensuality. Um, and then in terms of the corporate or social level, you have you know, the, the 
a fixation on ideology. And so you have you have virtue again without without any notion of what man is. And I think I think the practical aspect is just simply giving witness to the fact that Jesus is the son of the father and he's the son of Mary. And that's the good news. And the bad news is, is we're not like the father and we're not like the son or the mother yet. And so we need repentance and conversion and hence the uh, cross hmm. and the reality of the fall. But I mean, it gives a beautiful cosmic background that's very concrete and particular insofar as no, there was this God that was born at a certain place in time after, so to speak, um, he was born from all eternity from the father, but yet he was born precisely in a mode to fix our fallenness and our, and our, and our, our and our sins so that we can, we can actually be like the father um, and, and achieve union with him. So uh, I, yeah, I, I think really the, I don't know what the answer is, I think, you know, looking in terms of the principle of sub subsidiarity, well, I think I know in general what the answer is, is that we must become holy as individuals. Hmm. And that holiness will radiate. Uh, saint Seraphim of Serov, he was a Russian saint of the 19th century, he said, achieve peace within yourself and you will save, or, and 10,000 will be converted. Thousands, he said, hmm. will be converted. And that's exactly what St. Francis did. Um, this is exactly what every great saint does. And the sanctity radiates and it affects people in like valence levels of 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 of, a, of an electron it, it and they and there 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 are you know leaps in valence levels where it, it it's, god works surprisingly the holy spirit blows where he wills um but i think i think it's on the micro scale the micro to macro and that's that's how it works individually and corp and then that will fecundate and affect uh corporate or community life and then that community life will affect larger communities and i think that's exactly what saint maximilian was going for you know, with these uh, cells of the MI within these uh, houses and these cities of the Immaculate, that sort of thing. I think to bring it into the, the contemporary discussion, you know, Rod Dreher with his book that just came out a little bit. Live Not By Lies? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that I think that's a very pertinent. Whoops. We lost you. Thank you. Well, yeah, I, I, I think, I think, uh, so I mean, oh, go ahead. You, we lost you for a minute. Oh. Um, so the need to, so that there, and then the other question of the possibility of sanctity, because we've seen so many scandals in the church where person after person who have been looked up to as, as holy people, have been exposed as predators. Um, yeah. So not only sinners, but sinners, I mean, it'd be one thing if they were exposed as, you know, someone who fell into indiscretion, but when they're, you know, manipulating their spiritual directees and giving them favors, um, like with the founder of, of ARC, I forget his name escapes me, but you just have to ask, like, is there, is sanctity even possible? Is it possible for, the leaders of the church to stand is it possible um, yeah. for us to withstand and i think that what and this is a point that father peter makes is when he talks at times about this calvinistic pessimism that all sanctity is a ruse yeah so that's one point but then the other is like i said with this point of, of rod dreyer's of the need to organize and to supportive communities and then also i think of um the marian of the immaculate conception priest who wrote the 30 days 33 days to morning glory and that he made no in the second greatest story ever told father gately i think makes a comment that the uh, second greatest ever um push for marian consecration and this is in the American context. This, the third large, the second largest was St. Maximilian in Poland, 1930s. The second, third largest was uh, St. Louis de Montfort in the Vendée region in the late, uh, the late 17th century. That is about 100 years before the, the revolution. 
And then the largest is contemporary United States. You're yeah. saying, huh. he, sort of this, this sort of a providential ordering, which I mean, that's sort of a terrifying um, inference to draw, but I mean, that's a very contemporary point. Yeah, I, that, I, I didn't realize that somebody had made that claim. That's, that's quite encouraging and interesting to me. You know, speaking to your question, yeah, I, I think I think there is a, there is a there is good reason to be discouraged. But I think I think rules of thumb, and you I think you find this manifested in in the lives of the saints, is the danger of of self promotion and seeking uh, advancement and benefits and titles. Um, I think you find this in you know uh, well Saint Paul, Saint John said in in in. St. John the Baptist said, he must decrease, uh, he must increase and I must decrease. Uh, St. Paul said, I've determined to, to know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified. Um, you look at, uh, there's a letter by J.R.R. Tolkien where he says, you know, uh, anybody wanting to be king precisely because he wants that to be king is almost certainly disqualified from being king or ruler or leader. Uh, and, you know, you think about uh, uh, Father Peter's life himself. He wasn't given to self-promotion. And I think that's the great danger, uh, is this, this reality of, of self-promotion and uh, seeking it is already, I think, uh, a disorder in terms of uh, especially the spiritual life. Uh, accomplishing it creates not, it, it, the disorder manifests into an imminent danger. And so I think a, a great problem is, you know, sinfulness and um, ambition. Uh, again, the profanations of charity are at work and people seek advancement and they get it and I'm saying if you don't seek it and get it you're you still better pray because it's going to take supernatural assistance and the mantle of our lady being around you that you wouldn't fall but if you seek it and you get it I just I you know I I, I would say there's really no good reason to be confident in these instances so I think I mean I think there are certain indicators of of prudence well, I think, too, that in this, um, one of the things that's come to me, given these repeated manifestations of having people having a fallen mm -hmm. that have reputations for sanctity, um, is that emphasis of the spiritual writers on, like you said, that the greatest good is to eradicate evil from your own soul. And there's, you know, quotes from Souls and Heights and about how the line between good and evil goes through every soul. Yeah, that's right. Stuff from the imitation. And I think in the contemporary church, a lot of that has been taken to be sort of like just a very dark and pessimistic uh, post, or I don't know if you'd say post Tridentine, medieval, whatever, view that is no longer in concert with our nor with our current more optimistic views of human nature. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you think, I think you're right. And I think, you know, a lot of the... Uh, resurgence of uh, the, these push, pushes towards universalism, the empty, the empty status of hell is really, it's really the Chestertonian, what he, what he, what he emphasizes. And of course, this is classical Christian theology. Uh, it's, it's, it's despair moving into presumption. You know, the situation has gotten so bad that we've moved into despair and saying the only way to address this is if God just takes care of it and there is no punishment or retribution. And I, I, I think this is, this is precisely a function of despair all this movement towards universalism, uh, because the the situation on the ground and this systemic uh, kind of global, at least first world profanation of charity, both on the individual and uh, larger sociological levels, are, are simply they simply seem broken beyond repair. And so people just throw their hands up and say, you know, <laughs> literally to hell with hell. Uh, God's got to save everybody. That's. That's a very interesting because I, I remember, I don't remember where it is, but I, I remember seeing years ago, someone made the comment that we don't struggle from a lack of uh, faith. We struggle from a lack of hope. And you yeah. see that like yeah. my sister has one child and doesn't intend on having another. My little brother is also married. And he doesn't intend on having any children. Yeah. And I think it's despair. Things, That's right. Um, and so yeah. but then you can propose Mary as an actual 
where you can say, yes, everybody is sinners except for her. And because she is not, sanctity is also possible for us. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I mean, this is, it's, it, these are, these are wonderful reflections. They're very practical and it's just a matter of communicating this message. But I think, you know, the, the words, the famous words attributed to St. Francis and perhaps were never spoken by him, you know, preach always, use words when necessary. I, I really do think that's true, but I think people need to be ready to give an answer. And people, if people love, if people love the father, love his son and love the son's mother, they will want to talk about it. I mean, it'll just come up. Have you, know, you heard, hey. have you heard Father Dw Dwight Lognicker's uh, retort or rephrasing of that? Which says, no. preach, preach the gospel always, when necessary, use works. <laughs> yes, very good. Very good. Well, I, we probably should wrap it up. I think, I think um, it's getting a little bit late, so... Uh, we can just say a glory be and plan to meet next week. But yeah, thank you for your time and your questions. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, and uh, happy, happy feast days coming up. All right. Tomorrow. All right, you too, Jared. Yes. Uh, happy feast day of the Guadalupe. Yes. Thank you very much. God bless. Ave Maria. Ave Maria. Ave Maria.